Oh, I love that piece. Oh yeah, welcome to the show. It's uh, me, Hugh, and uh, Sandra's here, and uh, again. That's right. So we're starting the show now. Yet? No. <laughs> that's a loaded question. I have to see you twice a week now, so I, I better not be did. getting sick of you. <laughs> I know. <laughs> that's okay. Countdown. I was doing my practice exercises this morning, freeing and myself from the ego. It's, uh, it's working perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I guess we'll see during the show, right? Yeah. So yeah. you know what? I noticed that the whole Mercury retrograde, I'm really noticing it this week. Why? What's going on? Because you know what we talked about last week? It started last week. Yeah. And all the texts and the phones, everything's dropping. So either my Roger's phone is really messing up or the communication really is sucking this week. Yeah. And I'm misunderstanding things. People uh -huh. are saying things and I'm totally taking it out of context. Maybe that's my ego. I think I need to do the exercises. Well, I'll t you, you probably do. Because <laughs> I know, you know, the best way to learn is to teach, right? So yes. Oh, I know oh, you're not me. fully enlightened yet, no. like some people that have been on the show recently <laughs> and are coming back in a week or two. You're talking about Franco. Franco, yeah. Yes, he's coming back for two more shows, Yeah, actually. So that's going to be very, very cool, November and December. Yeah. The last show we're going to do is going to be called Crossing the Threshold. Because after that, let's say 18th, and then, of course, the world goes into fifth density on the 21st. No, fourth density. It's okay. solidly into fourth density. All right. Remember the whole three, four year yeah. thing? Then it goes into fifth. Okay. Right? I'm going to so. be on a train that day, going to Montreal. What, do you think on I, December I'll, 21st? Yeah. Do you think I'll be wow. okay? Wow. Yes, I think you'll be fine. Okay. I yeah. don't think you have to worry, Hugh. I think you're here for a while. I think you have much to learn. Yeah. I'm, I'm stuck <laughs> in third density. Okay. No, you're not. Fourth. Stuck in fourth. Okay. So, uh, speaking of communication, we've got a great video coming up. It's okay. uh, Mitt Romney's. I know it's only a week ago that the election was, but he, we, have Poor a, Mitt. we have his reception or his uh, ex, uh, whatever, the speech. L not acceptance speech. Yeah. And he, actually he had a hard time. He had a hard time with that, too, didn't he? Well, I you'll see how did. much of a hard time he had when we just play it in a couple minutes here. Talk about ego. But before we get to that, let's just uh, say we've got a great show today. We've got uh, the caretakers coming on in just a couple minutes. And amazing, they're amazing individuals. Play a couple of songs, uh, hopefully. Um, also, we've got um, Fidel Gastro here from. Uh, Rebel Without a Kitchen. It's a new show on the uh, Travel and Escape oh, wow. channel coming up <laughs> wow. in the spring. Also, <laughs> Sir Tao will be here. Uh, he'll be uh, performing. Oh, nice. Later in the show. Uh, also, Ben G and uh, Zach uh, Sheik, I hope I'm saying that right, are coming on the show. Uh, they're talking about the GMOs. Oh, you know, wow. The genetically modified. That's a big, big, Frank and food. big topic. And Jake Tiley's also coming on. He's pointing right now. He's I know he's got a lot of insight on Jake food. actually, yeah, Jake actually has, has had some amazing stuff happen to him. He's, he's almost like a different person. Well, we're all a different person than we were seven years ago. I'm talking about last time we had him on the show, Hugh. Okay. Well, we're going to find out about that when we come on with Jake in uh, a few minutes. So let's watch well, this. Well, we this have a packed show. We don't have time for Yeah, we got to get going. So we got to Mitt Romney with his uh, speech, and then we're going to come back with uh, the caretakers. Look for the ego. We'll be right back. You may think I'm overcome with torment and depression. Symptoms common to the loser of a big election. But not me. You see, I've got a secret weapon that keeps me happy and gay. I'm still rich, filthy rich. As far as I'm concerned, this election thing went off without a hitch. Now I'll have the best tax write-offs I could ever get. Well, he has nothing to get and blame for the U.S. going to H-E double hockey sticks. Oh, life's a bitch. Wait, except it ain't for me, cause I'm still rich. Take it away, boys. Oh, I never really wanted that low-wage president job to taint my career Cause I do on earth could possibly get by on $400,000 a year Now that I'm done pretending to have fun, spending time with the plebeians 
My speak and fee will multiply by three, so if you ask me, we won! This may be the happiest day of my entire life. I promise you I'm definitely not crying inside because I'm still rich, filthy rich. Trust me, my strategy worked perfectly, didn't have one single glitch. Shucks, I can go overseas and invest in whatever I darn well please. While Obama triple double checks his pension to make sure it isn't overly Chinese. Life's a flippin' bitch. Wave accepted ain't for me, cause I'm still horse riding, company acquiring, income hiding, employee firing, luxury yacht buying, rich. Thanks, guys. Click on my mouth, click on my mouth if you want to subscribe, gotta click on my mouth. Hey, let's give it up for the Mitt Romney Mormon Tabernacle Dixieland Band. Okay, so uh, <laughs> how'd you like that Mitt? I think it was very funny. I love the guitar playing girl. I thought she was amazing. And the guy was pretty good on the trumpet too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. It was so funny. All right, well that's my old news now. My heart goes out to him though, I know. Okay. I know. Well, we've got uh, we've got the caretakers here now, or maybe not all the caretakers, uh, but we've got uh, Jeffrey the uh, Martin and uh, Lena Montecalvo. Mm -hmm. Lena, is I'm yeah, saying that, that right? Beautiful. And also uh, uh, Mike Treblecock is here, the producer. And uh, great to have you guys on the show. Thank great you. Great to be here. You came all the way up to Hamil from Hamilton today, mm -hmm. and um, we're really glad you did because you have a new album, Love War and Propaganda. And, uh, and did you know this was up for, the, the artwork was up for a music award in Hamilton, or an mm -hmm. art that's CD right, yeah. award in Hamilton. So that's really amazing. The artwork is amazing, and some heroes, true heroes on this, like Gandhi and Martin Luther King, amazing. And that girl from Burma. <laughs> His name is really hard to say. <laughs> really hard to say, but we all know who we're talking about. All heroes. Uh, you know, yeah. I, I have to say... Um, the thing that uh, really, I, I got an email, and I don't know, uh, well, I, I guess you, you guys are pretty good at the PR game, mm -hmm. um, okay. but uh, I got an email, and it was, uh, I, I, it took me a while to actually figure it out that it was a band, because it was uh, a very, po it seemed very political, mm -hmm. Yeah. and uh, I understand that, that your music is very political. Yeah, most of it is. I mean, the album, this album name in particular, Love, War, and Propaganda, there are a few love songs, but in the context of, you know challenges of society today too but yeah most of my music is political yeah um, so my backgrounds and my career background is public relations and journalism I started that's how I started a career and and uh, sort of through Lena uh, Lena and I have been friends for 20 years and it was sh her that got me back into music too so it's really really interesting because um, I had made that joke at the beginning right off the top before the interview that <laughs> Lena looks too intelligent <laughs> and I don't mean this Wait as an insult sec. but she looks what? Too intelligent to be a singer. Okay, I, a I'm saying it. You're a singer. I know. <laughs> I sing backup sometimes. <laughs> Plus, I'm a bass player, you know, so I should be delivering pizza right now. <laughs> Maybe. I don't, actually, I, you're I, pretty intelligent too, though. I have to say, you're pretty intelligent. You. But, but you know, but you, I mean, you look like a professor to me, <laughs> interestingly. And 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 when I look at these, you know, some of the names of the songs, I think, well, this really is intelligent music. I mean, some of these words. Are pretty big, <laughs> and that's just the titles. <laughs> that's what I mean. Yeah. I'm just talking Lots about of yeah. syllables. Yes, you know, it's um, you know, it's it's so it's it's pretty. I would say it's pretty intelligent or sophisticated music. And then when we got to talking, you guys were telling me that you know you guys taught actually at Western. I taught at Western and Sheridan College public relations uh, post grad programs, and Lena so the, taught in radio a broadcasting. Copywriting and script writing teacher for, for journalism and broadcast radio radio broadcast students. But um, but Jeff really does do the majority of the writing. He's been collecting lyrics throughout life probably what, since you were like twenty years old. So maybe, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So he's always had a huge bank of songs that he's wanted to do something with and very strong opinions about what he feels are the injustices of the world. And for the I mean I do and I agree with Jeff um, for the most part in, his, in terms of his thoughts and his feelings. Um, I come at it from, I think, a different angle. You know, Jeff is a very sort of assertive spokesperson when it comes to causes he feels strongly about. Um, 
I like to come at it from sort of a softer point of view, especially as um, a single mom trying to make it in, you know, this crazy wow. world. I love my life, and I'm I'm not I'm never complaining about it. But it's hard for me yeah. to make ends meet, and that's okay. But it's I don't understand why in this day you know and age what? It's I not should struggle okay. that way. It's not okay. You're right. That's it's not, the thing. You're right that it's, not it's, okay. it's not. I mean, you have to be okay with that's it, right. obviously. But it's not okay. But there yeah, must be someone right. who we can blame for this. Mitt. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's we blame probably Mitt. a whole other show. Mitt Romney. <laughs> yeah, 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 the blame <laughs> show. Yeah. So, but this is our way of sort of, uh, it's, it's a release of some really um, um, uh, difficult energy sometimes yeah. that we've wow. collected over the years of our PR careers, and we liked what we did for a really long time. Um, but it's a demanding way to make a living, and the spin part of it does get really difficult. Yeah. But you and know, you need to be true, you know, a lot, we're interested in being true to ourselves now. Well, Lady, you had said that, you know, you don't make anywhere near the money you made when you were PR, but you are so much happier. So much happier. Now, you know, I mean, I was in a corporate career just, just trying to build my career so I could get a better job and then a better one after that and a better one after that, and it wasn't working. It wasn't working. So I made a huge leap of faith not very long ago where I just sort of stopped doing PR work, and now I'm cooking soup for a fine food market called Olive and Kiwi in Hamilton, and uh, I've never been this happy. Life is very simple, yes, and I've realized that's the way to go. This is right? so and amazing. But music's a big part of that balance, too, for, for both of us, I think. Wow, well, that's actually, amazing. speaking of music, why don't we? You're going to do a couple songs for yeah, we us. We do a couple songs. Yeah, we'd love to hear one now, and then we can come back and uh, chat a bit more. Yeah, wow. the first song we're going to do is called "37 Thirty-Seven Days in Jamestown." It's actually a song about Toronto. So, Jamestown, the uh, Jamestown in North Toronto. Yes. Yeah. Wow. yeah. Okay. that song ended it was just sounded so great oh, thanks. Yeah, thank you. like really good thank you. Nice harmonies. <laughs> yeah nice. really great harmonies and great guitar stuff and we uh, thought we'd bring a song play a song that was about toronto too so so no so why jamestown what were you actually there for 37 um, yeah, days well, or uh, that, that song came out of a there's a 
Toronto Canadian writer uh, Shaughnessy uh, Bishop Stahl wrote a, wrote a feature article in Toronto Life in 2006, and I was on mm. the train, GO train one day, reading the article, and it kind of blew me away because uh, I didn't anticipate, you know, some of this type of poverty and crime in Toronto. Wow. So that's where the song, I changed, you know, 30, 30 37 for rhyming purposes. Mm -hmm. but yeah, it was a big influence on me, so I wrote that song. And wow. Yeah, it's one of, actually one of my favorites on the album, too. So. It's a yeah. nice hook, very nice hook. Yeah, it's really good. Wow. Um, so uh, now it's a political uh, record, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, so but can you sum up, like, who's, who really, where's the problem? Where's where, the problem? Where is the problem? Oh, you really want to know the problem? Yeah, we want to know what the problem is. You know, I think a lot of the problem is um, is reflected in what we see in the Occupy movement today. You know, from you know, and, and I'm a big fan of Adbusters. You know, where this whole mm, movement started right. in Vancouver and British Columbia, and I think there's a lot of greed today in the world. Um, yeah. You know, we've seen all kinds of corporate failures and and um, and corruption. You know, political and corporate. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know what I find really interesting is, um, first of all, just notice that as you guys are playing music, I was looking at the CD and it's called Love, War and Propaganda and you have the PR <laughs> yeah. in white versus the rest of the type is in, in yellow. Yes. So I'm thinking public relations is yeah. really propaganda, right? Yeah. Is that the message with that? Yes. There's a bit of a message there and a bit of a, and I, I'm not um, slamming what I've done in my career in public relations, but you know, a majority of people that are practice quote unquote PR are spin doctors out there. Right. And I always tried to practice, and when I taught, more of an ethical sort of approach right. to public relations. And so it's my way or our way of saying, kind of fingering our own past yeah, profession. Yeah, and, and, and also encouraging people to pay attention, question everything. Yeah. Question what you're told. Question what you're told is the accurate information. And, and uh, question the source. Question the exactly, source exactly. of the information because yes. that I think is a, who's funding it. Yeah, that's right. who's behind it. Just because somebody put it in a media release doesn't mean it's what you need to believe. And just right? because it's in a science or a doctor's right. journal doesn't mean it's accurate either. Look at who funded it. That's so if it's right. the milk board Whose funding something benefiting. on calcium, yes. then the milk board, it's to their advantage to say drinking milk is good. Yeah. Of course. But you're yeah. never going to find a negative thing on milk That's if it's right. funded by the milk board. Yeah, there are all kinds right. of them. The bottled water industry, uh, fluoridation, um, uh, it could go on forever. Yeah. yeah. I think a lot of people just get their, their knowledge, their information from these 15 second sound bites yes. on and that's, mainstream yes, yeah. media. Yes. And you know, I'm very critical on this album of mainstream media and I come from the media too. So, so you can um, speak yeah. personally from the front lines actually. Uh, I really do. I, I, yeah. I don't think mainstream media does anyone a favor anymore. And that's why I think shows like your show and the internet has changed the world. We yes. can actually go out there and seek out the information and find out if there's, you know. But you also have to be even more careful. Yeah, because absolutely. Because there's even more information oh. being yeah. disseminated. But that's where you get to make the choice though, right, Lena? That's right. And that's, yeah. and so you're not just brainwashed anymore. So yes. you get to make the choice. Yeah. Absolutely. But I was going to, you know, you, you mentioned it, it's important that people uh, question everything and, mm -hmm. uh, and look for the sources in that. But you know, it seems to me a lot of people, at least most of the people I know, are already doing that, and so, uh, and yet the change that might need to happen or doesn't seem to be happening. So, I, and I'm wondering if there needs to be something more than just a awareness. Um, hmm. Well, yes, there has to be action, right? There, Which I is mean, the awareness, Occupy. Awareness isn't, uh, isn't enough if you don't take any action, right? Mm -hmm. But I think it's also very easy for us to get comfortable in our own circles and for, for you or me to say, you know, what I see, like you just said just now, Hugh, mm -hmm. where you say to yourself, you know, well, I do see people, you know, sort of uh, paying more attention mm -hmm. and, and digging deeper and that sort of thing. Perhaps in our comfortable circles, mm -hmm. that's the way it is. But I think, by mm -hmm. and large, as long as we still see this corporate greed, yes. we see these, uh, um, you know, the, uh, the spin that's associated with so many things that we see in our media today. Mm -hmm. um, I think you have to look far outside mm -hmm. of your comfortable yeah, networks I, yeah, I to affect that. that change. It's not enough to stay where you've always been. Yeah. You've got to reach yeah. out and you've got to be uncomfortable in, in a new space. I the think. funny thing about uh, the media today, like only because I've been part of the public relations and, and I've also been a writer, um, more than half of the news you read and watch and listen to comes out of either a PR agency or a public relations department. And it's not that it's dishonest or untruthful, but it, it's limited in its well, truthfulness. It's one, it's, one, it's one group or person's perspective, yes. correct? It's for one organization. It's, like right, it's one in the best interest of my organization to le leave you with this much information. Yeah. So again, it's no different than when you look at a journal and you read uh, you know, a conclusion based on some sort of study that they've done. It's right. really the same thing. It's based on that org organization's yeah. opinion. Yes. Yeah. Well, not only that, but you have news organizations like the big newspapers and mm -hmm. the networks cutting back. 
Absolutely. Not paying oh, yeah, journalists anymore. Right, yes. right. And so they're they're taking uh, PR releases. Absolutely. Uh, just and verbatim. And they're printing yes. the stories. And yes. they're not doing That's the research. Right. They're not really looking into the. Yeah. yeah. And there's the video news like releases, VNRs, now that you know a lot of organizations pump out for corporations on their behalf, wow. send them to the mainstream media, and there's their news. Right. You know, it was wow. manufactured. So. That's why okay. I'm a big fan wow. of Noam Chomsky. So. Well. Speaking of which, I don't know if uh, that's one of the songs, isn't it? Being Noam Chomsky? I'm becoming Noam Chomsky, yeah. That's one yeah. of the songs Number on the album. Five. So. Uh, but uh, is that the song you're going to do for us now? Or no, we're actually going to do uh, Ban Your Wanda, the song about the Rwandan genocide. Uh, that's wrote. the big word. Okay, great. <laughs> it's, easy, it's actually easy to say, but it looks complicated <laughs> when you have the word. R's and W's don't yeah. Mixed look like they should belong <laughs> beside each other. There's a lot that's of consonants right. in there. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we'd love to hear it. Okay. Great. And it's only one vowel, but it's four times. One, two, three, four. <laughs> wow. That's a tough one. And, and actually, the word it, it means people of Rwanda. Oh, wow. That's what it means, okay? Nice. Ban your Can't even say it. Okay. Ready? One, two, three. Go still a call and it's gonna haunt ya. But school bells are ringing and everyone singing. Then you wonder where were you when the people cried and confessed? Did school bells ring? Did anyone sing? a bloody mess Just on pity Blood on a city And so much despair Most couldn't find it Just left it behind Cause we didn't care Sorry, humanity cave. No one was saved. No Joshua story. Women and children, one hundred days of killing, so unholy. Just like the forties, a never-ending story, so chilling. So gory Many tears have fallen Oh, still a call And it's gonna haunt ya And you wonder But school bells are ringing And everyone singing And you wonder No war today The West said okay No war tomorrow Military police, no fear on the street, no more radio warning. Just like the forties, a never-ending story, so chilling, so gory.
I can see you've practiced your endings. <laughs> <laughs> In a panic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna end it. <laughs> on the album, it's a long song. We go off, and there's a, there's a lot of different percussion going on. Wow. So to give it that sort of African sort of, you know, yeah. chant. Well, I'm really looking nice forward to uh, to hearing the record because yeah. it, it just sounded great here, here Guys, and now. Nice, nice performance. Now, speaking of Rwanda, we, we don't have a lot of time left, but I want I want to. Uh, you guys mentioned you uh, do some work with War Child. Uh, yes. Do you want to wow. just talk about that? Yeah. Uh, a couple of years ago, Lane and I decided we wanted to pick some you know charitable organization that we thought was relevant to us and also meaningful too. In War Child Canada, we we did some busking for them at the the Super Crawl in Hamilton Festival, which is a huge event, absolutely yeah. huge. Th this was yeah. the third year I think this year we had 100,000 100, people, so wow. it's our third year for wow. busking. Wow. Right. And off our first album, we gave a dollar for uh, the, f uh, we gave five hundred dollar donation to War Child Canada on our behalf as the band, from the first five hundred CDs that we sold, and then we've raised almost two thousand dollars for War Child from nice. Busking. Nice. So, yeah, Good it's, it's job, a great guys. organization. Um, they do amazing things. Uh, the, the, our first video off our new album, Flowers for Peace, they provided us with some footage from the Sudan uh, ch <gasps> Children's Refugee Camp, wow. and that song was written. Wow. in the spirit of children in war zones too so it was a real it was fitting for us too and, and we're really yeah we're big supporters of it they, they do great stuff so well wow. we're actually gonna get a chance to see that video in, in uh, just a couple of minutes Yay. here but great. Uh, great. also but we want to make sure people know where to get this and uh, get the whole record and hear all the other uh, songs on it but before we do that, um, I know you're playing, you're coming back to Toronto this week for uh, a show, right? Yeah, Thursday night we're playing the live annex. It will be an unplugged show with Lena, Mike, and I. So it's our first gig in Toronto, so we're happy about that. Nice. That's a great club. Yeah, we're looking forward to it. We've been there, like, seeing other people perform. So, so Thursday night, what time do you guys go on? Uh, nine, around nine-ish, so that could be 9.30. You know? And yeah. then <laughs> what you, in the world of you know, live music, the nine o'clock. Or live internet TV. <laughs> uh, but what time, are you doing, like, uh, the the, the whole night? Or? Uh, no, we're, we're three bands and we're going to be doing the first set, I think. So we're okay. doing a 40, 40 minute set. Great. Okay. We're so probably nine, nine, most of the album. You know, Super. Album wow, well, that's very nice. Fun. And the record's available at Sunrise Records uh, on Young Street, Just too. over uh, oh, nice. Stone's Throw yeah, from here. Yeah, so nice. they've yes. been a big supporter of us. Uh, An actual store where you can go in a and actually store. buy. A real store. Yeah, a real yes. record store. So. That's nice. Although you can download it and purchase it online as well. Yeah, you can buy it online. Okay, where do you do that if you want to buy it online? You can buy it at our website, uh, thecaretakers.ca. Okay. Yeah, okay. And our Bandcamp site allows you to buy the album, too. And... Um, also, I understand you've got a big uh, show in Hamilton on December 7th? Yeah, that's going to be our official CD release party at the Casbah in Hamilton. So we're really looking forward to that. Yeah, we'll have yeah. a full band and uh, we've some got great openers. some great opening acts. Mm -hmm. Friends of ours who are, uh, have been helping us along the way, Adam Bentley from the band called The Rest, City in the Sea. And Mike's new band, The Low Heels, are going to be playing too. So it's really wow. it's going to be a great night of music. It really is, and we're excited. Is that uh, right downtown Hamilton? Yes. King and Queen Street, yeah. right downtown. Yeah. Is it a good club? Hamilton it's a great club. Okay. Yeah. yeah so if you're from Hamilton, you'll know what the oh, Casbah yeah, is. Oh, yeah. And I think yeah. a lot of Toronto Tonians that get into the city for music will know the Casbah too. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Yeah, it's going to well, be Hamilton's a good night. Hamilton's got some amazing talent. Yeah. Thank you very Indeed. much. Indeed. <laughs> okay, guys. Well, it's great to have you on, and. Um, Good luck with these gigs, and you, please let us know uh, your future uh, releases and that sort of thing. Yes. We'd love to hear yeah. more. Thank and you for back. sharing your personal well, stories. Thank you for having us on. It's been thank great. Thank you very much. Thank very much. you, guys. So we've got the video now, Flowers for Peace, mm -hmm. and I take it this is the studio version yes. of, of the song, so we kind of get a, a chance to see what the produced version is like now versus mm -hmm. this fabulous live performance. So thanks, guys, for coming on today. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. And uh, so here's the video. We're yeah. going to come back with uh, Jake Tiley talking about uh, how to get ready for what's happening in the markets and more. We'll be right back. More politics. Why 
Okay, we're back here on the show. Ooh. Got a little bit of an echo there. Okay, it's gone now. Okay. Ominous. Anyway, that was awesome. Uh, the caretakers. I might go see them Thursday. Oh, me too. Uh, they sound too awesome. Too bad it wasn't Wednesday. We could all go there. I know. It's right around the corner from. I know the co- the class. Where we're be. I know. Okay. Hey, we got Jake Tiley here, and we're talking about. Uh, well, we're we're really going to get into preparing for market volatility, Jake, and I. Uh, that's that's sounds ominous. Market volatility. Yeah, that doesn't sound so good. Ominous. Well, I mean, you know, if, you, if you're in the right, if you're volatility, that's what the whole game is about. If you can swing and ding with the hits and the misses. Right, but it means you Not gotta be. Not to. I'm just picturing Wonder Woman. You know, with with that gear that she has. Pretty much the bracelets that deflect, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, you yeah. gotta get really real good at that, though, yeah. right? You know, so what's what's happening? Why are the markets going more and more volatile? Are we going to hit a threshold and it's going to get super volatile? It's called December twenty-first. It, that's where people make the money, um, and so the people that run the world already have uh, positions. So the more that they make us feel the volatility, the more they can take advantage of those volatile positions or bet on volatility, and the more. Uh, scared the population gets, the more important it is to really understand the statement. Um, okay. If you if you feel like puking, buy. And it's somewhat like, I when you want to puke, you buy. Um, it's by a guy that took three hundred thousand in nineteen eighty, in the early nineteen eighties, and turned it into twenty three billion in uh, two thousand by two thousand and eight. Did he puke? So he says, Paul Tudor Jones, uh, one of the greatest traders on earth, said, you know, when you feel like puking, that's when you make your best trade, generally. Uh, now, oh my God. Now that's counter to everything, which is when you're feeling good. When you're feeling go- good, sell, and when you're feeling bad, think about buying more. I mean, you're always owning but your, your judg- loss, though. And you're not blaming someone else. But isn't your judgment off when you're feeling bad? How does, you how have does to, that work? You have to learn that you're... you're your first loss is your best loss and when you start losing in the market you start to learn it's like a schooling um, and when you get a chance to go through that schooling for about five years you'll make better decisions your your bet sizes are gonna go down and you're gonna make some wins and then you're gonna be on top of the world and say hey look at me ma I'm on top of the world and then the next trade you're gonna do you're probably gonna be on the bottom of the world because that's invariably what happens so it's uh, bef- between here and fear and greed is uh, the best place to make your choices. Quick question. You mentioned the volatility right off the top, and you said the powers that be, the, the high, high, high guys. Do Banks, they, brokerages. Do they ever experience powers. the volatility? Because you talked about the little guy well, experiencing it. Well, they're rich to begin with. I mean, so they never, they get to Mitt set the volatility? Isn't the in the cabin in the woods He with doesn't have to worry about his Chinese portfolio anymore. Uh that's an interesting point. Next year is the year of the snake, and um, oh. as you understand, I do cycles work, and I do market cycles work, and you know moon cycles work, and uh, astrological cycles as well. And we have to see that uh, the year of the snake next year, which could be much more um, prosperous, this year has been the year of dragon, which has been very cautious, and that's been seen. So prepare for um, more uh, strength out of China. Investors, if they just want to have a little bit of exposure to China with the top names in China, they can look at the FXI, which is an exchange traded fund. It's like an ETF, an exchange traded fund that trades like a stock. It's a basket of of, uh, high profile Chinese companies. That's the FXI and uh, that's something they can look at. Uh, owning a hundred shares for the next five years kind of thing. Okay, so uh, we don't have too much time here, Jake, and and you were talking about preparing for market volatility. I mean, what can people do today to prepare for this? I came out um, a couple of times on uh, the wonderful liquid lunch, and uh, I mentioned Apple looked really Mm -hmm. good, and we had a nice run. It got up to over 700, and I got out to my uh, clients, which have grown substantially, which I'm very pleased to say. Um, part in, part in uh, to do with uh, Liquid Lunch, and people have seen my uh, clips and have contacted me and asked me to be, uh, you know, their client and some wonderful stuff. 
Um, Apple got very overbought around the 700 uh, level and uh, it fell 24% in uh, the last month and a bit. Wow. Um, and I didn't wear my red pants today, my red polo pants, which I normally do if Apple's down on the day, because mm -hmm. everyone's in their, in their head going, why am I in Apple? It's supposed to be the greatest company on earth for the next 100 years. And uh, it's, it's basically traded a little bounce. But people have to understand, the way that you look at markets is the inverse the way that you look at the world. So if you think the market's going to hell, you probably, and you're a novice or uh, an intermediate player in the market, unless you're some clairvoyant, you're probably on the other side of that trade. So you really want to buy the market at that, at that particular point. And if you think everything's rosy and it's just wonderful and we're going to have this great economy going forward, it's probably good to lessen your positions. It sounds like what you're saying, Jake, is that we should do the opposite of what we think we should do. Pretty much. And it's hard to do it because you, you buy the stock and it goes down 5%. Yeah. Um, you buy 25 shares of like a company like, you know, if you like a company like, if you like the ETF like F FXI, you don't have to buy the 100 at, you know, in the 35, 38 range. You can buy 25, as Jim Cramer does say, and buy 25 lower, buy 25 lower, because you're never going to get, or rarely going to get the right price until it's 45, and then you made an $8 move and on 100 share, that, that worked out pretty well over three years. Okay, so the one mm. strategy I think I'm getting is that you, when you want to puke, you buy. <laughs> you buy, but you buy small and you, and you own that loss. It's like poker meets, uh, you know, the firing line. You know, gun to your head, what do you do? Immediately, wh where do you think the markets are going? Close your eyes, because you're a n novice investor, yes, right, Sandra? Yes, I am. And yes, you're I am. a very s smart woman. So what do you feel is the best investment out there? I'm saying right now, Apple. Did you feel that? My gut check, right? Yeah. They've got 150 billion in cash and they lost 145 billion in market cap. That's an interesting look. We'll have to do an analysis well, and come back when Apple's no, either 700 because, or no, 480. No, no, the reason I'm saying that is because I know Apple's uh, sunk a bit, but, but over the long term. That's an excellent point, and I think leading into... I'm not saying making money, like I'm talking making money 20 years down the line. Apple, Apple's disagree. a long-term investment. Tell you why. That's what I was thinking Well, the, I, I will get to the disagree, just to say, let's, let's come back and say Apple's today 547. Um, I didn't look at the exactly, we've been trading between 537 and 547 before I came on the show. Um, leading into Christmas, this company could trade at, you know, 600. Um, but it might go lower to 520 or 510 uh, before it does. Um, but it's going to go way back to up, do that. correct? Oh, that's a good question. That, do you have any Apple in your portfolio? No. We'll, we'll get, revisit this and in two months, I expect we're going to see some okay. very interesting okay. things in January. Okay. You know what? And there's a technology fund, the XLK, which has Apple in it, which you can take a look at it and get a basket of technology exposure without the cost of Apple, which is $547 okay. a share. Now, you took the other side of the market, and now it's the world's best video game. Okay. Why, don't, why do you think Apple is uh, primed for going lower? Because I think they're making the same mistake they did in the, in the PC market. Yeah, they had a great product, but they, they still only have 5% of the market share because they're not, uh, you know, they, they, they fight uh, s uh, standards across uh, different companies and right. across different industries. Right. And they're doing the same thing with the iPhone. Because from what I understand now, that Samsung's coming out mm -hmm. with things like the Note 2 that are actually much more configurable. Um, they're much more, uh, you know, conforming to standards that many companies are adopting. And to me, Apple's making the same mistake they did, and so they're relegated to 5% of the market share in the PC market, and I think the same thing's going to happen in the phone market. I think you have some great points about interoperability issues and some of the connectivity issues with, you know, Flash, and the reason why Apple really doesn't use Flash is because of 
the fact that they don't want you to be able to use Flash and access other, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thanks, but I want to make that choice. I don't want Apple to make that choice for me. Okay, and I so, want to look under so the this, hood. Now, see, if now, I want to so look under the hood, I want to look under the see, hood. See, now you look at his approach and look at my approach. I came from a complete feeling. He came from the thinking, right? And, but the thing is that even from that, he's saying, okay, because they're doing this wrong and this wrong and this wrong and this wrong, that's why he wouldn't. But I'm saying because there's so much room to improve, I think it's once they figure that out, it's going to go up. And they got rid of Scott Forstall, who probably wasn't a good hire at the company, uh, even though Jobs really liked him because he was um, he was almost a megalomaniac, from what I understand, in the way he operated and housing engineers. And um, you but know, that seems to be the corporate culture there. Um, Tim Cook is more of a pragmatic um, believer in uh, getting things done in a good way, maybe not the best way, and mm -hmm. he's and he's fierce at at. And he's fiercely determined. So, you know, we're right at the, you know, at a, a range where Apple could trade lower. But I think you may be onto something. If the markets hold up, it could trade uh, higher. There's better opportunities out there, and girls should look into diamonds and what Harry Winston may do over the next ten years. Well, uh, I was going to say silver. And silver. Uh, how come silver? Because I think it's the more affordable commodity right now. That's a very interesting choice. So it's the it's the poor man's gold in in, in essence. Yeah, exactly, right? exactly. And there's there's great silver companies in Canada. Silver Wheaton, which is uh, SLW, which is a royalty company. That's in by no means a recommendation, but if you look at how these companies perform in more um, strengthening economic times, which we may be leading into, um, it'll be interesting to see if you can buy it on a pullback in the next. Uh, month. Okay, Jake, we're almost out of time here, and I want to make sure that you say everything you want to do, but I just want to ask you briefly, everybody's talking about the fiscal cliff, Greece just passed their austerity bill, and uh, you know, they're just, a, they're just a little bit ahead of, everybody's going to hit that wall at some point. What, what are your thoughts about that? You just mentioned we might be going into more prosperity, but we got that fiscal cliff. We have that fiscal cliff, but it comes at a great time. Just before the uh, the Christmas season, we can ramp up into uh, greater markets in terms of the upside. And you've got this negative fiscal cliff issue and austerity in Greece and 54 unemployment. 54% uh, unemployment among the youth around the world between ages of 20 to 25. Wow. There's so much negative. Um, it's almost hard not to say we're going a little bit higher, maybe 5%. Uh, in the in the coming months, in the next six months. Um, as for media and exposure, Facebook, I think I was on here and yes. it came down pretty heavily. It went from 40 to uh, 1760 and then bumped up to about 25. What's it, what is it now? It's, it's in the $20 range Kay. and uh, it may represent a buy uh, for the next five, 10 years. Um, but always remember when s your neighbor's telling you to buy it, uh, get in touch with the show. They can get in touch with me at, uh, at jake at softanalytics.net and uh, that might be the best time to get rid of it because your neighbor probably doesn't know what Facebook does. Right. And regarding the fiscal cliff, that's just media hyperbole coming to you in a time where it's possibly the right time to buy because it feels so wrong. Okay. Right. Can I ask a question? Do we have no time? Monsanto. Yes. It's performed Bye. incredibly well, and they seem to have the right judges in their pocket worldwide for the returning <sighs> of, uh, of their policies. But you know what you want to do? You want to look at how prices work in when you hear about the big droughts in the Midwest, you know, $8 mm -hmm, corn. Mm -hmm, now mm -hmm. corn is seven twenty, seven sixteen on the low. So when that big news comes out, that might be the time to wait for a pullback. Corn might be a good opportunity in the next 10 years. There's an ETF, there's companies like CORN that also uh, you know, track corn a little more um, closely and don't cost as much with the risk in the, in the futures market. And there's some other indexes like the RJA, which is the Rogers uh, Commodity Agricultural uh, ETF as well, W which allow you to take a position in corn, but you don't have the exposure and the downside uh, loss. So even wow. if you don't like eating 
genetically modified foods, you can still make money. I, I like to be... How do you reconcile that? I like to be organic and uh, do less GMO and, uh, you know, look at those ETFs, those like uh, agricultural commodity ETFs um, to take the other side of that trade and in my body GMO is less. Okay, okay so very interesting. Ones. Very interesting. We're going to have a conversation okay. later on in the show about GMOs specifically. Yes. So Monsanto. Jake, thanks for doing this today. Now again, where can people get in touch with you if they want to? At softanalytics.net with Jake at softanalytics.net and regarding the GMOs and Monsanto, they are now working on GMO beet GMO. So for for uh, actual production for fuel. For beets. For beets. Which is also good if you're a, a big juice fan. For you can have genetically fuel. modified beets rather than just Borscht natural and beets. fuel. Get ready. Okay. Wow. All right, Jake. This is great. Thanks for doing Thank this. Thank you. As always. Interesting. Interesting Okay, stuff. we're going to take a little break. Uh, we, we Actually, we've got a video uh, with Fidel Gastro, Rebel Without a Kitchen. We're going to come back with uh, Matt Basile as uh, Liquid Lunch continues. We'll be right back. People love to know, especially with food, what's the next big thing? Every night, essentially, is an opening night for me. Show up in a place that definitely is not a restaurant, make it one for a few hours. We're at the Evergreen Brickways, we're here for Toronto Ground Market. The city loves this type of event. The crowds get crazier and uh, there's new vendors all the time. You know, it's food at its most uh, simplest form, you know, off the table and it's good. It's street food at its finest. This will be, I believe, my fifth time. Uh, each one, you think they get easier and easier, but they actually get harder and harder because you sell it out fast the first time, so you gotta come back, make more food this time. They definitely don't get easier, they get harder as they go on. I got pretty late, I mean, we have about an hour, and I still have about 500 buns to cut. Uh, I still have salsa to make, still need to get fire on all my water to actually, actually Ryan, put fire on the water, bro. There's no tablecloth, so I can't even set my table up properly yet. Everyone on my staff came late. Uh, my girlfriend who's working cash isn't even here yet. There's just no time for anything. Okay, we're starting in like 15 minutes. I know, I know, but you have the cash box and... Okay. We need money, baby. I'm just stressed out because there's a lot still left to do. And... All right, you, shirt. Sure. We're late, just so I need you to boogie. Well, I gotta make sure you know how to cut a bun. If you cut it all the way through, you're gonna be in the bag. Yeah. Okay. I set up uh, at bars, breweries. I'm gonna do an outdoor market. I'm gonna be in the middle of Dundas Square. So, and I do the museum. Like that's in between the dinosaur's legs. Hey! Hey! Uh, the next goal, to increase my awareness, you know, my brand exposure, to do bigger events and produce more product, is to probably get a food truck. And once I get a truck, it'll just take my business to that next level. So the next goal after that is uh, I want to open up a uh, Fidel Gastro branded butcher shop. The Fidel Gastro packaged goods, barbecue sauces, marinades, dry rubs, so that people go, oh wow, that's a Fidel, that's a Fidel. That's it, wrap it up. Because every dollar counts and every minute counts to get this business to where I need it to be. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Things that I constantly have to worry about. Who's gonna come work with me on site? Are these people gonna be really reliable? Because I'm, they're not really my staff, they're just helping me out. The last thing I need to hear is that my, you know, as I get busier, the quality of my food is slipping. Come on, Matt! You're driving me nuts right now. Bro, look at me right now. I need you to listen to me. I need you to put meat in these sandwiches. More meat, more meat, and put the salsa on top. It's not hard, okay? Quality can never change because that's what brings people back. And at the end of the day, you just need shit done. Hey! Hey! What's happening? What can I get for you? Look at our, this is all our line. This is all of our line. How many buns do we have left? You are way overstuffing. There should have been at least 650 sandwiches made. Make it last. I do not want to sell out early. It's 8.45, we should be going wait till 9.30. Folks, just so you know, I've sold out a Swampy Jose. I still have three kinds of sandwiches left. Olay! Right? Is everything out of there now? Yeah. Those are empty now? So whatever's here is what we have? Oh my god. Uh, a little stressed out. Right out of two sandwiches now. So we're down to two. Um, 
But we have a good amount of the rest, so we're just gonna pump it out, keep it going. Oh! Nine left! I have nine sandwiches left! Sold out, folks! Sold out! Oi! Oi! Oh! Wow! What a night! I pooped. You're exhausted. Oh, I love you. Yeah, you better. <laughs> oh, <dear. laughs>Okay, so there's the, uh, I guess, the trailer from uh, Rebel I, I Without just, a Kitchen. I, think, I just think he's so intense. Well, it's Matt. Whoa. We got Matt right here. I'm intense. Watch out. <laughs> Sandwich world is rough, right? Like, you gotta, gotta be I'm scared. So th now this is going to be a, a TV show uh, starting in the spring, I understand. Correct. Uh, yeah, uh, it's, uh, the show is called Rebel Without a Kitchen. And it literally just uh, it looks at all the different facets that are my business uh, and how my life has become my business uh, over the past year and a half. And it's gonna be airing in April on the Travel and Escape Network and very excited. It's been uh, only, you know, my company itself is only a year old and it's been quite the year. It's so your life has become kidding. your business and your business has now <laughs> become a TV show. Yes, which is also the life. So it's funny, we're right back at square one. So, <laughs> okay, let's talk about your business then. Uh, you say the company's been around for about a year, but tell us the story about how you, you know, how did your life lead to the creation of this business? Well, it's amazing because I actually, uh, people call me chef all the time and I actually correct them. I'm like, I am not a chef by any means. That's I'm, chef to yeah, you. No, it's not even, it's not, <laughs> it's, you know what, I am, I'm Matt, I'm Fidel Gastro, I'm the rebel without a kitchen, but I've never gone to culinary school and I never actually had a, my passion and dream was never to become a chef in someone's restaurant. That was, mm -hmm. wasn't ever a, a goal. I just really liked food a lot. You mm -hmm. know, it was something that I experienced with my family and with friends and at no point did I ever see it as a career choice. I worked in butcher shops growing up as a kid and uh, I was always, exposed to the food industry, but I always saw it as a stepping stone to help me get me through university. And mm -hmm. then I would use university to go on to a career, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I went to McMaster for four years. I went to Humber College after that for advertising. And then I went to U of T after that, so. Well, what'd you wow. take it at McMaster? At McMaster, I got my English degree there, so. Okay, and then wow. U of T? U of T, I did uh, marketing and PR. Okay. So I uh, worked professionally uh, at offices, at ad agencies, and for the client for about, you know, four or five years and I started to feel a lot of uh, career anxiety. Not in the sense that I wasn't happy with my jobs. I felt like I wasn't really reaching my potential as a as someone, you know, involved day to day with you know, with working. You know, I'm like mm -hmm. if I'm gonna get up every day, if I'm gonna put everything I'm you know, everything I have into a job, it should be for me. And it should be for something that I, I care about and wanna see grow properly. And uh, I was like, that's it. I got to figure out what I, what I can do. So what was that? that and what was, is it yeah. exactly? What is it exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Well, it was, uh, it was food. You know, it started off with my product is food. Now I needed to create a voice to kind of catapult that product. And that's where my marketing and back, you know, advertising background came in. And one day I was just coming up with ideas. I was a copywriter, you know, so I used to just write, write, write. And then for whatever reason, one day I wrote Fidel Castro on a piece of paper. I turned the C into a G. Like Fidel Gastro, that's interesting. Uh, there was no business registered under the name Fidel Gastro, so I bought it. And that was like a year and a half before I even launched the company. So mm -hmm. I was just sitting on this idea. Mm -hmm. Wrote a business plan, uh, which took me about a year. And the idea was to open up a location called Fidel Gastro's, because at the time, that's all I really hmm. understood as, you know, if I was gonna go in this direction, this is how you do it. You this open a the, restaurant. You open a restaurant, yeah. right? Uh, I myself didn't have a lot of money. I only had about $10,000 saved up, but I figured the idea was so good yeah. that, you know, what bank wouldn't want to invest in it? Well, uh, lo and behold, I was wrong. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I went to the bank and they were saying, you know, Matt, uh, good idea, y you know, we're not, you're not viable as a business. And I was like, what do you mean? I, I did this whole business plan thing. So that was, uh, that was crushing because, I mean, and I was ready to just say, forget this thing. You know, yeah. it was a good idea that will never come to be because what they were expecting out of me, uh, it just didn't make sense number wise. You know, I was destined mm -hmm. to fail basically, set up to fail. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it was just not, you know, it took all the fun and the, the love that I had for that concept, took it all out. What was that, just dealing with the bank about it? Dealing with the bank and hearing the numbers and the fact that they wanted, 
you know, my parents' house as collateral. Oh, yeah. All of a sudden you oh, hear something wow. like that and you're like, no, man, no chance. I can't do that. Yeah. I can't do that. Yeah. So wow. uh, I stepped away from it and I said, I'm not going to pursue this. And then one night I was at a party and the party was hosted by a good friend of mine who's they're a band here in Toronto, down with Webster. And uh, we were all at the party and, and a bunch of the guys, they had a DJ there and they had a bar set up and they were like, yo, Matt, why don't you go make us some food, man? And I, we opened up the fridge and I started cooking for, the, for everyone at the party. And in that process, I realized that making food was just as much a part of that party as the music and the bar. So mm -hmm. I was like, okay, maybe that's the business, creating a food experience that has no physical location that you can constantly move from place to place to place so that you're not necessarily uh, ingrained in one community specifically. You are the community that you're kind of taking with you everywhere. Mm -hmm. And people will, like in my head, I was just like, yeah, people will follow this. Like, I think there's something here. I went home that night, I wrote a, I took a 45 page business plan and I condensed it down into three pages and it wow. started with a simple line of dinner with Fidel Gastro. Like that was it, that was the core idea. Mm -hmm. And that's how I kind of evolved into this mm -hmm. pop-up food company. And I was literally, you know, the, the, you're probably saying, what the hell's a pop-up food company? Well, it's this concept yes. of, you know, here today, gone tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna work out uh, relationships with either other restaurants, bars, you know, with fashion studios or art galleries, anything that I can kind of just get in their space, sell my products, set up for a few hours, sell out, and then leave. And that's essentially what, how I launched this company. I took any gig I could just to get my name out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. there's been huge, we're right in the middle of a massive movement in Toronto, about street food specifically. And there's something in this city called the Toronto Underground Market, which is a monthly uh, food market for young entrepreneurs. So I saw this and I was like, this is, wow. this is me, this is who I am, you know? And I think it was my, my second month of business. I'd only done like two or three events at that time. I got into that market and I started becoming a monthly regular there and at the same time doing private functions and other gigs. Like I've collaborated with Steam Whistle Brewery and now I'm working with the ROM. I've done work with City Hall. So I really just saw an opportunity to just do a lot of work. And mm. it meant working seven days a week, 20 hours a day, every single day, but it didn't matter because it was for me. And I knew that at some point there would be a return and a payoff. And mm -hmm. you know, I think right now I'm finally starting to see the legitimacy and that I am viable and not uh, you know, a fluke. Take that big bank. Actually, my bank loves me now, so it's funny. Oh. Well, of course yeah, they love yeah. you now. When you don't need the money, <laughs> yeah. of course they love you. Yeah. Uh, we get along great. So, so now how you're going to loan them the money, right? Yeah. No, I, I still live in my mother's basement. They'll so need I the money one yeah. of these days, very shortly. <laughs> uh, or they'll need the and food. they might be uh, coming on your door, Matt, and then you can tell them. Door no, Matt. we they don't. They might be coming you're on your viable. door, yeah. Matt. You're not viable. <laughs> no, did you hear what she said? What? You're not, they'll be coming on your door, Matt. Get it, doormat? I get it now. <laughs> Thanks for pointing that out. Okay, so I'm not funny. Okay. Uh, now, Matt, but how did the TV show uh, happen then? Well, uh, I've actually, since starting the company, I've also launched a food truck as well. So I now have a food truck, which is an extension of the Fidel Gastro brand. And as part of this, um, I knew someone that knew someone that had done a show and they said, hey, we have this guy named Matt and his business is crazy. He always works, he's got tons of energy, you should meet him. That's literally how it started. Wow. They're, like, well, they're like, Matt, do you have any ideas for a show? I was like, yeah, you know, I have this idea for a show called Rebel Without a Kitchen, because that's literally what I am. I'm a rebel without a, look, a kitchen and this is my business. And they were like, okay, yeah, that could work. So, uh, you know, we shot a demo and then we shot a second demo and we didn't really hear anything back for a few months and that's, quite normal apparently mm -hmm. I've never done anything like this so I was like okay sure and the next thing you know uh, it was Travel and Escape that had uh, you know they saw the footage actually I'm pretty sure it's the footage that we saw today okay. and they were like okay this could be a show and then I got a number back saying like okay we're, we're about 70% on board and then you know a couple of days later it was like you know what we're about 78% on board and the next thing you know it was like yeah we're at 99% and I was like is this actually going to happen now and when we found out that the show was ago 100%. Mm -hmm. I was like this is this is wild like where where did this all happen where did this come mm -hmm. from like mm -hmm. you know I, one day I'm sitting in a cubicle just dreaming of the day that I can start this business and not you know one year later uh, I'm book I'm doing everything from weddings to working alongside you know great chefs like Mark BQ and I've done events with you know and I'm not a chef and then launching the food truck getting the show it's unreal it's unbelievable mm. Mm. Wow 
Talk about, you know, the investment. When you do go to bank, they want location, location, location. With you, it's no location, no location, no location. Yeah, no fixed address, talk right? About, yeah. yeah, talk about turning things upside down. So I'm getting hungry just talking to you, Matt. <laughs> Well, that's weird. <laughs> Don't bite me, please. You didn't bring Remember, any I'm samples, intense. right? I brought, yeah, I got sandwiches in my pocket. Well, yeah. I, no, I, <laughs> and that's another thing too. Like the sandwiches themselves are quite an extension of that brand. Like, so if I'm like, if I'm gonna go to market with a sandwich, I can't just pull out like a sandwich. A sandwich. It's gotta be a sandwich. I actually call them extremo a sandwiches. A gel sandwich. Yeah, that's that's the product, right? Is the extremo sandwich. And oh, okay. uh, so I do things called like, one's called the gorgeous Jorge, and it's a peanut butter pulled pork with bacon jam and pigskin crackling. Or I'll do the Kingzilla, which is a, a root beer braised short rib with homemade kimchi. Do you have anything for and vegans? Do I have anything for <laughs> vegans? Uh, my shirts are uh, for sale, and they are 100% meatless. And no, I'm kidding. Uh, I don't. It, here's my thing. I do um, have vegetarian options on occasion, and you know, I do a macaroni and cheese I guess sandwich. It depends on the event too, right? It depends on the event, but I, I, this is what I try to. Uh, this is what I try to say that you would never go to a. a a vegetarian restaurant and order a steak, right? Correct. Because that's Correct. not their product. Correct. And unless it's, it's a tofu I, steak. Unless it's a, well, I'm talking about a T-bone steak, like oh, a, okay. a steak that came from a cow. Okay. And uh, likewise, you know, it's not that I have anything wrong with that. It's just it's not something that resonates with me, mm -hmm. and it's not a product that I am, you know, super excited about both cooking or eating. So I don't really do it. And I just well, think it's fair, right? Well, at least you're honest about that. Though. I, I'm you very do honest what you do well, right? It. And but I do eat at vegetarian restaurants. I mean, my girlfriend likes. Uh, you know, she likes fresh, so we'll go to fresh. I have no problems with eating it. It's just not something that I get excited about cooking, so I don't do it. How did you get excited about putting peanut butter on a pork sandwich? Well, I, clearly it was an accident that I uh, I dropped clearly the jar. Clearly it was an accident. Yeah. You just dropped the peanut butter jar on the pork on the sandwich. Pork and, and said, hey, we got to run with And peanut butter is so runny that it, it actually spilled onto the pork sandwich yeah, exactly. too, right? Yeah, exactly. It's so. quite like it. No, you know what? I was, uh, it was actually for, I was doing the Toronto Beer Fest uh, this summer, and I was, uh, I was sponsored by a baking company to be there, so they gave me all this bacon, and I was like, okay. I had about 100 pounds of bacon. I'm like, I gotta figure out different things to do with bacon, and one thing I do and really enjoy doing is bacon jam. It's, mm -hmm. you know, you essentially you're turning your savory, salty bacon into a jam spreadable form, and I was like, okay, well, how can I make a sandwich out of this? And I was playing with some ideas. I was like, I do like a peanut butter and bacon jam sandwich, but I was like, okay, well, why just peanut butter? Why not throw some pulled pork in there? So I literally marinate the pork in peanut butter, and soy sauce, and that gives it a, because you're making fun of the consistency thing, so that yeah. makes it a little more pliable, right? And then you braise it for four hours in that, and it becomes quite liquidy at that point. You add a little more peanut butter to it, and wow. add pigskin crackling to it, and there you go, you got the gorgeous Jorge. So, um, now, where can people, I mean, I'm getting, uh, like I said, I'm getting hungry just talking to you, but where can people, uh, and you mentioned this underground. Uh, the Toronto underground market. market. Yeah, what yeah. is that, and where is it an yeah. actual, physical location where people can go and get food and stuff? Yeah, it's, it happens every month um, at the Evergreen Brickworks, which is an amazing venue. And we actually saw, the clip you saw was from uh, the June edition of the Toronto Underground Market. Okay. And if you go to yumtum.ca, that's how you would, you would find it. But uh, to find me, I, I tell everybody that you know social media is what drives the mobile food business. And if it wasn't for uh, mediums like Twitter or Facebook, uh, or blogs for that matter, I would be no different than the lemonade stand that kids used to put at the end of their, their driveways, wow. right? So wow. uh, literally, it's, it, Twitter has been my number one Bread vehicle. <laughs> yeah, it, you know, understanding how it works and how you engage with people and how you really let them know that uh, you're le legitimate and you're not just some dude selling sandwiches. That, mm -hmm. you know, I, I cook, I rent a space that is a certified kitchen and I am properly trained in all matters of public health and Toronto food safety. You know, I am not just some crazy guy who's making sandwiches in his mother's basement and selling them. So I've had to structure this very much like a business, but it's a business that I feel has gone the alternate route. You know, I said, you know, I'm not gonna take on this risk and open up a location. I, I know that there is another place to be and it just made sense with the Fidel Gastro brand to be a rebel without a kitchen. So besides hmm. the underground market, where else can people like who are walking around the city, uh, where me? can they come and sample your stuff? So every Friday night until the end of the month, I'll be uh, at the Ro Royal Ontario Museum. They have a, an event called Friday Night, Light, Friday Night Live at the ROM. So I'm a, a mainstay food vendor there. Uh, I do weekly uh, food truck services all over the city. Tomorrow I'll be at the UFT uh, Scarborough campus. On Friday I'll be at 
U of T downtown St. George. Sunday I'll be at the Santa Claus Day Parade right at the Sony Center. So and then I do a lot of private bookings as well. And so how do you plan where you're going to have your your mobile truck? Do you have to get permits for well, that? Well, the thing is, there's a lot of red tape about uh, mobile food trucks in Toronto. Yeah. Uh, we are quite behind as far as the food truck movement. As like, if you look at cities like Vancouver, Calgary, Hamilton, St. Catharines, then going into the states like Flor parts of Florida. Um, New York City, Austin, Texas, like Portland, Oregon. These are all very progressive cities uh, with, with street food. Toronto is so far behind, mm -hmm. it's not even no, funny. No, behind in what sense? Yeah. Behind in the, uh, the, the red tape and the infrastructure to allow food trucks to operate freely. Mm -hmm. Because of that, we have to resort to two things, festivals mm -hmm. and private property. So literally a private property uh, or an owner of private property, like in this case, let's say, University of Toronto will allow me to, for vendor fee, pull my truck into a designated area that's been signed off on by everyone saying, Fidel Gastro truck can park here from the hours of 11 to 3 p.m., no earlier, no later, and sell food to our people. That is right now currently the only way to operate business. So Whereas in these other cities, what, what's different? What can those trucks do? Some have just curbside pull up. In Hamilton or in Buffalo, sorry, uh, as long as you're 100 feet away from another restaurant, you can pull up to any curb and wow. sell your product. Uh, you know, Very you pay cool. a flat rate for the wow. year, and that's how you operate. Wow. Um, a lot of other cities have, you know, street food hubs where you basically sign up for a, you know a spot in each hub on a weekly basis, and you alternate hubs because there's sprinkled there's enough food trucks. Mm -hmm. <coughs> sorry, there's enough food trucks in these other cities to allow you to do something like that and to, you know. How'd you get the Santa Claus parade? I would imagine that would be a That a was through suite. the Sony Center, actually. So the okay. Sony Center uh, down at Young and Front Street, they have been very, very forward about saying, you know what, we want to increase street food uh, presence in this city. Because if you look at any other top mm. 10 city on the world ranking of best cities in the world, street food is quite high up on the list, except for the city of Toronto. Wow. So, they said, you know what, we are going to help you guys out and give you guys a, a place to kind of put your trucks. So they, right. that's where we came wow. in. Wow. Wow. All right. So now when the, the show comes on in the spring on the Travel and Escape channel, Rebel Without a Kitchen, what can people, like, what, what are people going to get out of, of watching the show? They're like, wow, this guy works way too hard for very little money. What the hell is wrong with him? You know, it's, uh, <laughs> why does he do this? Why is he doing this? Why is he sleeping, you know, on two the floor hours of a night. kitchen? <laughs> two hours a night, you know, and. Uh, I, I think it's going to show a lot of things that in order to be successful at anything, you have to really love what you do, yeah. you know, uh, that there are adaptation is, you know, my strongest business uh, like skill. skill, you know, it's what I, I bring to the table. The fact that I said uh, I couldn't do one thing, which was what people have an idea of. So I did something else. And I think anyone can take that and apply it to what they love, you know. How can I, you always hear like, you know, transferable knowledge. How can I take what I love and turn mm -hmm. it into my mm -hmm. own career path? Mm -hmm. These are things that are available to you. You just have to kind of see beyond what's right in front of you. Also, you know, the logistics of opening up a food truck in Toronto. We've seen a surge in them in the city this year alone. I can only wow. imagine what the next five years are going to bring for food trucks to Toronto, wow. right? So and so maybe it may also help with the, 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 the policy environment. I, uh, I definitely see that we've seen a lot of change already in the last year. Mm -hmm. Wow. And nice. I personally have gone down to City Hall and given dip deputations on, on the matter. And I've voiced my opinion quite strongly, not from a what's wrong with you, City of Toronto? Why aren't you doing this? But from a business perspective, you know, <laughs> yeah. if you, it's just, you know, you look at the food industry. We are an industry, right? And just like any other industry, and you can take stock brokerages for, for this matter as well, you have your top tier banks, but you also have you know, discount stock brokerages, and then everything in between. Why is it in the food industry we say the only thing that's viable is a restaurant? Then we have bars, and then we have hot dog vendors, and that's it, right? There's about a 50% you know, market share that they have completely missed out on that every other major city gets except for us. And by questioning it like that, instead of saying, instead of, you know, passing blame, but yeah. instead of yes. just opening yes. it up to discussion, yes. saying, look at the value you are yes. missing out yes. on. This the is, benefit. These are, the benefit. Yeah, yes. These are tourism dollars. These yeah. are other companies like, think about Eat Street or, you know, in this example, you know, the Rebel Without a Kitchen show. These are taking things that are, you know, considered underground and making, providing to the, to the masses. Why wow. would you deny that? Okay. Nice. Well, Matt, we're looking forward to the show. Looking Very forward cool. to the food. And, uh, and uh, so 
Now you got a website. Let's tell people where they can get in touch and, and, and keep on track of what you're doing and when you're going to be on TV and all that kind of stuff. For sure. So FidelGastro.ca. Uh, my link to Twitter and Facebook is all right there. Uh, Rebel Without a Kitchen uh, will be in April on the Travel and Escape Network. Super excited. We have 13 episodes that cover everything from pop-ups to getting started to launching the food truck, all the different kinds of events I've done, the wackiest events, the kinds of clients I deal wow. with and uh, the sheer amount of labor of love that goes into what I do. The passion, wow. that's what I saw in that clip was passion actually. Oh, for sure, actually. the passion, yeah. and we're seeing it right now here in the interview. So uh, yeah, I, I'm getting the vibe that, that, that the, the environment in Toronto is going to open up and loosen up. So people I think who are gonna watch the show are gonna maybe get some ideas about how they can be part of this street food revolution. Yeah. I encourage it, you know, as long as people are doing it for the right reasons and uh, they see that, I mean now, you'll see like a, a Swiss chalet truck driving around the city. And I see that, and I think it's funny because a year ago, you know, a company like that would have thought I was crazy for doing what I'm doing. And now that they're kind of, they're kind of missing the point, right? You know, they're, uh, they're using it as a, as a vehicle, as a, anyways. It's an emotional missing the point, thing you know? too, yeah. I think for them more than anything. Matt, 20 years ago, if you would have said you'd have been here leading this street food revolution, I'd have said you're crazy. Yes. Yeah, so no, go. let's push that big ball of oil out that's, the window. Yeah, exactly, right? So that's out of Seinfeld, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Right okay. when, he was, when he worked at Plano. Exactly. Look, look at yeah. those Seinfeld quirks <laughs> and quips on the show, yeah, right? Yeah. Your Seinfeld. Uh, Love the Seinfeld. Can't go wrong with that. Okay, Matt. Thanks for coming. Cheers, guys. Thank you. This. Thank you. Good luck. Good luck to Cheers. all of it. Thank you. Sounds so amazing. Okay, we're gonna take a little break. Come back wow. with Amber Fish as like the launch continues. We'll be right back. Wow. Nice Cheers, energy. Thanks.
the show here, and uh, we are now joined by the Marquis de Amberfish. And there's the CD and uh, Amberfish. Great to have you back on the show. Good to be back. I can't believe it was three years ago that you were here the last time. I know it feels like uh, three Yesterday. weeks ago. Yeah. <laughs> I've actually been just uh, living uh, by the uh, the Canadian Tire across the street. That's why uh, I haven't changed my sunglasses since, I since you last they have saw me. Over there. Oh no! Like I've been busking and. Uh, oh okay. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so, I really had no excuse. See, he for took being you late literally. Oh. <laughs> it's okay. We're late too. No it TTC happens. issues with you, eh? No. Yeah. Not, not. Darn subway. So, what have you been up to besides putting your record together, or? Well, uh, that's pretty much been the main thing. Yeah. Um, uh, since I last saw you, I think the last time I was here, I had like a little five-song demo uh, that I had printed up like twenty copies of, and uh, since uh, since then, I've basically collected all my home recordings uh, about half of which had already been recorded uh, when I was last year and I I put them together in an album and uh, that's that's what you see right but now. But did you did you redo them or were, did they need to be redone or or did you remaster them or? Um, no uh, I did uh, I had about five of them already done uh, mm -hmm. that you heard last time I remember I played Vampire Song and uh, um, so about half or two-thirds of the album has been recorded uh, pretty much the same way at home um, just on a, my computer uh, I use a, a something called Adobe Edition which is a, you know people talk about like garage band and um, mm -hmm. uh, programs like this this is essentially a slightly more I guess a slightly more lo-fi version of those um, and you know you can just record uh, multiple tracks at once and uh, it's sort of like a the modern version of a four track where instead of like nowadays where instead of like having to bounce multiple tracks onto one track like they did with like Sgt. Pepper you can uh, you know a cheat or a, uh, a musician who can't necessarily afford a lot of studio time right, no uh, which is probably most musicians can just do it at home and uh, you know they have limitless they don't have to worry about studio time and stuff like that so I guess I'm one of uh, N uh, numerous musicians who's taken advantage of the uh, opportunities afforded to us by technology nowadays. Good for you. Are you liking the sound of it, of what you've accomplished with it? Um, I've had a pretty high standard, which is good and bad, because there's quite a lot of stuff that I spend, you know, hours working on, and at the end of the day, it just doesn't, uh, it doesn't live up to it because of the limitations of the sound. Um, but the stuff that I've kept, the stuff that I've decided to uh, record in a, or uh, put out on an album has been I've been pretty happy with it. Uh, people generally are a little bit surprised to hear that it's been recorded at home. You know, everyone asks, oh, what kind of mic do you use? What kind of studio? Or what studio did you go to? And I usually just tell them, you know, I use like a $200 mic and like my computer, my old 30-year-old PC at home. Well, that's, wow. a good, that's a good mic for 200 bucks. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Um, and, well, you know, it's, I don't think there's any, uh, y y you need, I don't think you need to apologize for recording at home now because the technology is there. Mm -hmm. You can do mm -hmm. such a great job. Definitely. Uh, it's so much better than it was when I was in high school trying to do some right. recording. And mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I, I actually think you can do everything as much as you, you could in a big studio in a home studio. Plus you get to play all the roles too, don't you? Because you're playing all the instruments, you're doing yeah. the producing, the engineering. See, that's tough if you're the drummer though. If you're also doing the drumming, I don't know how you do that. Did you do that? You Did you do friend your, your own uh, drumming? For the most Stop. part, there isn't drumming. Uh, so I really had to focus on my uh, timing, my rhythm guitar yeah. playing so that the uh, percussion was implied because yeah. uh, I'm headhunting for a, a John Bonham right now. Oh, and they're and hard to find. A bass player, Hugh. If oh, uh, well, I... There you go. <laughs> okay. I can press I'm start and stop. Really? Yeah, for when the recording... Can you play tambourine? Yes, I can do that. Okay, or back of I vocals. can play shaky yes. egg. Okay, <laughs> I, I, I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it. A band, <laughs> a full-blown a full band. Okay. <laughs> I like it. Hey, we'd love to hear a song now. Uh, okay. Now, is, uh, what, are the one you're going to play, is it from the album? Uh, no. Um, honestly, there's a, I really only play like one song from the album. I'm sort of, uh, not the, like I'm really proud of the album, but I have quite a lot of music that's uh, unrecorded. And, For the uh, next album. Yeah, I feel that, like that's why I'm really trying hard to find a band, because that is what it is. It's like my, it's like my Sebado indie home recorded type thing, but I really want to, I don't want to settle into that rut of just being comfortable recording at home. I, I know that I need to Spread full up my sound a bit. A bit. Yeah. 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 Okay, what's this song called? 
Um, okay, I'm gonna do a song called Blue June. I wrote this last year. It's a bit more bluesy um, than some of the other stuff. And uh, I don't know if it's gonna sound that good because I ran here uh, from across the street. My mouth's kind of dry, but I'm gonna give it a shot. Okay. Okay. Some uh, that's a that's a real song there. Oh, it's thanks. Catchy. Yeah, nice. it is catchy, and it's, uh, it's the, the falsetto vocals are whenever I perform it, it's hit or miss. So I'm gonna have to go home and watch it and critique Oh no, myself. no, it was good. It was that's good. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, got, you yeah. There oh, you go. thank you. Oh, yeah, that's very course. thoughtful. Thank hey, but uh, yeah, absolutely. I could see a rock band just rocking out with absolutely. that one. Absolutely, that would be a lot of fun, actually. Yeah. Mm. I like the fact that it's the lyrics are really easy to catch on. Ooh, 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 oh, those ooh. ones, yeah. yeah. It works for me. It took me so long <laughs> to write those lyrics. Like I had like a Bob Dylan thing. I was like, should I go ooh 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 or ooh hoo hoo? But I that was or or do 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 do. That must have been like the really tough question of the day. It was. <laughs> Talk about sophisticated rock. <laughs> so okay, so it's interesting that your uh, the, the music that you're playing now is really not what's on the record. It, it sounds almost like this is kind of you're getting this out of your system. Yeah, a little bit. Well, uh, I think that my songwriting uh, remains the same as it was when I, uh, on the stuff on this album. In the, uh, I'm kind of a songwriting purist. Uh, you know, grew up listening to the Beatles and stuff. I believe that um, a song uh, should be something that you could sit down and play on an acoustic guitar. Uh, it's just you know, like when you strip away oh all yeah, the sonics sure. and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, but the my the presentation of the songs is a bit different now because. Uh, um, I've been relying on electric. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the recordings that I've actually recorded since this album came out have been on a, a Fender Telecaster, which is my favorite type of uh, electric guitar. It's just like a, it's so simple. It's just like a plank of wood. Yeah. And you know, it is what it is. Like, 
you can't hide how good or bad of a guitar player you are on a telecaster. I really like that about it. But yeah, um, my presentation has changed a bit. I'm playing electric, which, uh, you know, it's uh, you won't really notice much of a difference now because I'm still doing it myself, but uh, playing electric is a bit more conducive to, um, uh, you know, to having a band, to having yeah. a full band. Well, would you do one more song for us? Yeah, sure. I We'd love to hear it. Sure. What's this one? Uh, this one's called I See Water. I See Water. And yes. you do see water right now. I see water. In the glass. I drink water. Yeah. Oh. This is the remix. It's called I Drink Water. <laughs> That's the electric version. Yes. <laughs> Fish. Wow. Or should I call you Marquita Amberfish? Uh, we talked about this last time. Uh, I think we both decided Amberfish is okay. Because okay. then Marquis, Amber people are like Marquis de Sade. I know, but it's right here on the record. I know. I've changed my name, so I don't have to worry about that anymore since then. To Amberfish or from Amberfish? Uh, to Saratau. I know. So, <laughs> I don't, you know, so okay, why are we calling I'm Amberfish? Really yeah. Okay, okay. So uh, Saratau is uh, my performing name right now. Um, I think I just feel like, you know, when I get bandmates, I don't really want to go around calling myself like Marquita Amberfish because I'm not the only person in the band. There's going to be three or four equal members, you know? Right. Um, yeah. yeah. That's a good feeling. I just feel like Sertau is more of a, it sounds like more of a band name, you know? Sertau, what is that? Is that? It's a Portuguese word. Oh. Uh, it means, um, it means the part of the land uh, that's away from the ocean. Uh, it was generally used uh, in colonial times in Brazil, I believe. Um, uh, I was watching this movie by uh, Werner Herzog uh, called Cobra Verde, uh, and there's just one part where uh, the main character, played by Klaus Kinski, says, um, uh, you know, that he's talking about moving towards the ocean, and he says, the Sertao dries our hearts and kills the cattle. And I don't wow. know. I just thought it was a really beautiful piece of poetry and a, it's a really nice beautiful word. word. It yeah. is. And you can sort of like, if you really wanted to, like, kind of like draw a connection. Amber fish is watery, and now oh, Sertao yeah. okay. is uh, <laughs> away from the water. So, okay. yes. <laughs> All right. Well, Amber fish. It's been great to have you on. Uh, do you have any uh, upcoming gigs that people can check you out at? Um, I. I'm pretty sure I have a show at Aspetta Cafe in Kensington Market coming up soon. I just don't know the details. Um, 
So what you can do uh, is you can look me up on YouTube, youtube.com slash Marquis de Amberfish, uh, all one word, of course. And uh, I think that what I'm going to start doing is take advantage of the vast resources on the Internet. And instead of just like posting like a Facebook thing, I'm going to actually make like 30 second trailers yeah. for shows. Uh, yeah. That's just a to good be more idea. creative yeah. like that. That's a really good idea. So, so is that your, the, your website? That's my website. YouTube.com yeah. slash Marquis de Amberfish. Yes. Okay, great. Well, thank, and I guess people can hit you up on that and find out yep. how they can get their hands on the, uh, the CD. Yeah. Fall in the sun. Yep. So uh, thanks for doing this. Oh, we got a video, right? Yeah. Heaven sent? Heaven sent, yes. Nice. So thanks for doing this today, uh, Amberfish. Thank you. And, uh, thank you. Best of luck with the band, yeah. getting the band together. And uh, Oh, thanks. Hit me up. Maybe We'll I'll come back in another Saturday three years. Now. Okay. And I'll have right. some Maybe he'll play bass and I'll do the tambourine. Okay. Or you can play bass. And oh, yeah, yeah. That's I'll play the shaky Oh, boy. <laughs> it'll be really different kind of music. Okay, so here's the video. Have it set. We're going to come back with our uh, last guest of the day, Zach Sheik is here. We're going to be talking about genetically modified food. We'll be right back. Wow. Thanks, guys. Thank you. It was the last day of spring. We watched the waves come up high and drink the town. Swallow the stars and take the world for a ride. Round and round, restless swirl past the trees, round the bend into the sea. Brackish lust, ocean foam, the hills they blow, a mountain top to pop the sky. Californians. The biotech industry is about to launch a misinformation campaign against the labeling of genetically engineered foods. They have done it before. The biotech industry might scare you into believing that labeling would cause food costs to go up. They might scare you into believing that farmers are against it. They might scare you into believing that it would prevent us from ending world hunger. The biotech industry will try to you so you forget what the issue is. Do we have the right to know what is in our food? It's a simple yes or no question. This is a simple proposition for California in 2012. The initiative would simply require food sold in retail outlets to be labeled if it contains genetically engineered ingredients. Just like nutrition facts with no costs to consumers or food producers. Over 40 countries labeled their genetically engineered foods, including the entire European Union and China. The health risks of genetically engineered foods are unclear. There have been no long-term trials ever conducted on humans. Before the FDA decided to allow GMOs into food without labeling, FDA scientists warned that GM foods can create unpredictable, hard-to-detect side effects, including allergies, toxins, new diseases, and nutritional problems. They urged long-term safety studies, but were ignored. 
we are unknowingly feeding these foods to our kids and ourselves without having a choice. It's our right to know. Let the biotech industry proudly label their products. Let the people of California have the right to know what they eat. Label GMOs. It's our right to know. Okay, we're back here on the show, and uh, it's funny how uh, we, we were talking about uh, Monsanto mm -hmm. earlier and uh, Being the a business really implications. Good investment. But we've got Zach Sheik here, and we're talking about uh, GMOs in general. And Zach, uh, you've got a campaign going on. I do. Uh, to uh, just tell us a little bit about it. It's got to do with genetically modified sure, food. Sure, definitely. Um, our campaign basically began about a month and a half ago. Uh, it, it is under www.labelgmos.net. Basically, we're just looking for consumer awareness, um, just to create awareness within the community, within certain communities as well as worldwide, mainly on this side of the world right now, mm -hmm. uh, as to what people are eating. So, and just, just to have a choice basically between, um, between eating genetically modified foods or not, not eating genetically modified now, foods. Don't they do this in, in Europe? I believe there was a big, big movement in Europe a few years ago yep. about labeling it. Is this where this is a takeoff from or? Definitely. Um, I feel very much so because it wasn't until I went over to Europe. My family's okay. all from Scotland originally. Okay. So when I went over to okay. England and Scotland, it wasn't until I went there and I realized, wow, they in their grocery stores, it says there's big signs saying we do not carry any GMOs for human consumption. Really? It's that, it's that obvious? Yeah. And it wow. wasn't until I went over there as, um, as a younger adult uh, that I noticed that. And then working at a place like the Big Carrot here in Toronto, that I really was able to kind of flourish in that, indus or in that industry a little bit more and then learn more about it for myself too. It's sad that it's an industry. Actually, you know what? Yeah. The fact that it has to, oh, Well, with sad. the big carrot though, and, and on the other side, they have their own industry going where it's, they've created their own labeling campaign basically because there is no labeling whatsoever. So it wow. almost has to be a grassroots movement. Now, why wow. do we need labeling, <laughs> Zach, on these genetically modified well, <laughs> organisms? Well, I guess my story goes back to uh, <laughs> just after I was born. I was diagnosed with over 350 food allergies. Um, oh my God. So I struggled quite a bit uh, growing up. Uh, I also blew up to about 248 pounds between grade seven and nine my, at my heaviest. So you can just imagine I was quite shorter than, than six foot two. Um, Wow. So uh, to say that I delved into my own health and that I looked into things is kind of an understatement because I really, really struggled. And I've now come to the point where I am a fitness instructor, I am a personal trainer, uh, I'm certified in many different uh, backgrounds, but my main focus and main goal is to help people attain their own, their own goals. And um, basically 75% of that has to do with your knife and fork when it comes to uh, what you want to do with your body. Well, now, so where did you get the connection that being that heavy was connected to the 350 food allergies, what's connected to the GMOs? Yeah, definitely. Well, um, it was, it's really weird when I was growing up. I was allergic to over, again, over 350, all, all nuts, all peas, all beans, all fish, all chicken, turkey. Oh my God. Uncooked tomatoes, all peppers, all animals, all seasonal allergies. So you can just imagine living with my grandparents like I did for a number of years, and as grandparents are, I was getting all the ice cream eat, I wanted, eat, all the chocolate eat. I wanted, yeah. all the pop and candy and chips, and I blew up to quite a, quite okay. a large size. So. I was only able to eat unhealthy food and things like beef and pork and certain vegetables, but it wasn't until I spoke with a nutritionist and an allergist um, and then went back to my doctor and they had suggested that uh, I s eliminate all of my pharmaceutical drugs that I was being basically overdosed on at the time that were suppressing my immune system. So when I went back to my doctor, I explained I wouldn't be, well, my mother explained for me that I wouldn't be taking any more drugs whatsoever. And I grew out of those allergies within six months, out of about 75% of those allergies, after I'd been told that I would flat out die by the age of 20. So these drugs were to help you with the allergies? Basically, yep. Wow. They were to so, oh, support so my immune system, but at the same time they were suppressing right. and not... And but okay, but, but the thing is, okay, so you went off the, al the, the drugs, okay, but why did you have to go on them in the first place? Because you had the allergies. Yeah, well, you can just imagine as, as a young child with a, a single mother raising two kids, the doctor would be calling my mom, and I've been told this later on as an adult now by my, by my parents, and and uh, family members, but the doctor would call my mom and basically say, we have a new trial drug on the market. Your son can test it out for free as long as you, you know, accept the liabilities towards that. So I was almost a test bunny with some drugs, wow. if you can say. So wow. basically it brings me to the point now where when I learned about GMOs, it was such a huge thing for me and such a huge thing that had been concealed mm -hmm. and covered up mm -hmm. and just swept under the rug. And I really delved into it and I really had to know everything. I, I really need to know both sides of the story for myself in order to 
to gauge things. It's it's a really good point because you know when I grew up, and I'm considerably older than you, but when I grew up, peanut butter was a mainstay at school. Yeah, I had peanut butter sandwiches every single. Everyone well, did. Yeah. Every That's story about peanut butter. Now you can't have it, but what I understand now you can't even have it. You can't even bring it in the school. Can't even be in the same no. room. I went through I mean, those I years actually when that was being instated. It's a really funny story. When I was in grade. Three, I remember uh, they were just starting with the peanut butter bans in school, but my school hadn't been banned yet. So what okay. they did was they sent me to the detention room uh, with the <laughs> detention kids because I wasn't able to eat peanut butter. Peanuts weren't even my main allergy. Um, they're not even, they're, they're a legume actually, but peanuts were, uh, it was actually tree nuts that were my, my main allergy. But because peanuts were across the board, they would send me to the detention room. I remember grade four, Mrs. McPherson was my teacher. I came in the first day in grade four, full ban was in effect for peanuts. I was sitting in the front row of the class and Mrs. McPherson sat down and said, kids, if you'd like to know the reason why your parents can't save money anymore and buy peanut butter and jam sandwiches for you for school, he's sitting right here in the front row. <gasps> so there, nice. and you remember those things. Oh like, as an adult, you remember that God, until later on. Oh my she said that? Yeah. <laughs> so How old were you? I was in grade four, so. Uh, you I were nine. Was she yeah, a popular 10, teacher? 10 years old. Uh, no. Unbelievable. <laughs> no, that was the first day, too. Oh, now, now you could sue her. Right? Yeah, I guess now, I could. Now you could, could do it. Yeah, but, 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 but the other thing about the peanuts thing, what I found out, and I don't know if this is true, you might know, but what I found out was it's not the peanuts kids are allergic to, it's the preservative. Yeah that they put on the peanuts. Yeah, and that's what I found out later on in life too. I, for example, I can eat chickpeas when, the, or excuse me, I can't eat chickpeas when they're in a can, for example, or just straight from the source. But if I boil them down, mix with a little bit of sunflower oil and make myself a hummus, I can eat those chickpeas. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, so wow. it's a protein enzyme I found out that I'm actually allergic to. But, um, but I guess to get back on the topic of GMOs, when I found out about them, I couldn't believe that the rest of society the rest of uh, my community, including doctors, didn't even know what they were, what they were consuming, and I just, in a, in a way, I feel that's morally wrong. I mean, if you're consuming something, it's that's our that's our, our life right. source. Yeah, and that's next our right to, water to know. And oxygen, this right. is our life source. If that's being tampered with, regardless of your religious belief, I don't believe anyone should be playing God whatsoever in well, that sense. Well, and not only that, I mean, now that in Europe that they're labeling it, well, this it, outright uh, bans in some countries. Bans, in yeah. But for Canadian farmers who are permitted and uh, encouraged to grow GMO crops that they can no longer sell in Europe or other places. Like, yeah, what is that, that doing to yeah. our the farm economy? Well, which that's is what happened with our shape. wheat market at the beginning of this year when uh, Stephen Harper basically just allowed the wheat market to be sold to international investors. Um, I remember it was just last uh, two years ago, excuse me, that Monsanto said by 2012, 2013, Canadian wheat will be genetically modified. And back then, farmers have been fighting that since I believe 2004. They stopped. Mm -hmm. um, uh, GMO wheat from entering the country back in 2004 and that was at the farmer level basically yeah. the consumers didn't even know what was going on these are just yeah. the farmers saying this is wrong yeah um, I believe it was a 33 billion dollar industry that we lost out on both France Japan England and Germany vowed they will never buy wheat from us ever again because we cannot verify that it will be from a so credible do we have source. GMO wheat in Canada now uh, to be honest I'd have to speak at a farmer level to yeah. find out about that yeah. I know that there are people that want to implement that yeah. I know that Canada is one of the last places here where we have credible wheat we have credible alfalfa for example organic alfalfa still which um, they do want to introduce into uh, into Canada which is very scary because you that's goodbye bye to organic industry so entirely. what is wrong with these GMO foods now we're gonna we're gonna watch a video at the end that might shed some light on it and of there's course. a lot of people talking about it but you're you're involved in this like what is wrong with this well, Stop. GMOs, for those people that don't know, GMOs are basically uh, a splicing technique from the, from the biotech industry. It's also called genetic engineering or GE. Basically, you're taking the, uh, it could be um, a gene from another plant, animal, bacteria, or virus, and you're splicing it and entering it with a gene gun. So they're just shooting genes from a gene gun into another gene of another plant, animal, bacteria, or virus that would never come in contact with each other in nature so normally. So you could take an animal, a fruit fly gene, mm -hmm. and put it in a tomato or something Exactly. Like or for example, a strawberry um, taking, uh, taking a gene from an Arctic flounder and entering it into a strawberry in order for that strawberry to last longer in frost season. Is that a real that's, story? That's what they're testing now. Uh, you know, and I had heard too that in tomatoes they had put rooster beak DNA. They tested a lot of things with tomatoes. The, tomatoes were the first ones. So I thought, you know, here I am trying to be, uh, here I am a vegan and really... I'm and, eating a tomato. And I heard you bring that up in one of the last interviews, too, about being vegan. I actually worked the Veggie Fest just recently, and I couldn't believe it. Um, I was working for Vega, uh, which was created by Brendan Brazer at West. And um, basically, 
I went by one of the corn stands, and you have all these people in line. And I myself, I'm, I've, I, again, with my allergies, I cannot be a vegan. I've tried, but I lose uh, all my protein and all my fiber. Um, there were people in line for this, for this corn, and it was a 100-person lineup with all these wow. T-shirts, like, why I'm vegan. So I went to the guy who was selling the corn, and I said, well, obviously, you're, you're selling organic corn. I mean, 99% of corn is genetically modified nowadays. And he says, he scoffs at me and says, no, that's, that's way too expensive. This is conventional corn. So you're looking at BT corn. This is... Um, this What's is a corn that? that was created in, uh, between 2006 and 2008 by Monsanto. So basically, you've got to remember that under the, guise of, under the guise of creating more food and creating food faster and creating food easier, these companies like Monsanto have been able to sell to farmers and sell to, um, basically buy organic seed banks, create their own seeds, and then sell these seeds to farmers under that guise. But in reality, all they've ever done is created um, seeds that, uh, that can take more pesticides or plants that will take more pesticides, excuse me, or that will grow their own. In, in, uh, in the case of the BT corn, this plant actually produces its own pesticide as it grows, killing off a species of monarch butterflies. And I mean, I don't wow. know when the last time I saw a monarch butterfly was, which is very scary to me too. Wow. I remember seeing them all the time when I was a kid. I saw a lot this year. Did you see a couple? Just monarch so you know. I saw none. Yeah. I saw none. So I, I was saw looking. a lot. This, yeah, but I was the, looking. It's the monarch kind? Yeah, they were, they were the monarchs. Okay, okay. okay. good, okay. good, very yeah. good. And okay. then also killing off a species of locust. But in terms of uh, in California, just, just last month, they did a study on, it was 100 pregnant females. Now they found the BT um, the BT pesticide residue was in the, the females as well it passes the blood cell barrier to the child. So you've got yeah. whatever, and we know now that pesticides cause, or pesticides um, have caused tumors, they've caused cancer, they, they're linked to Alzheimer's, there's, there's links to Crohn's, there's links to IBS. And allergies, not to mention and allergies, the allergies, as, as well, allergy exactly, yeah. Now, do you, um, oh, I forget what I was going to ask. Well, That's then, the GMO. Then I will See? go. You've been eating too much of that BT corn. Oh, uh, my God. But, high fructose uh, corn you know what? Because I, I, I went to another thought, and I want to go back to my other thought. That's okay. okay. Go. But um, so I, I just can't believe that these companies, like Monsanto, they say it's safe, right? But, but they're not allowing any third-party testing. That's another big yeah. thing that, that raises my eyebrows. What I don't get is how they can even live with themselves mm, to allow this stuff. And it also gets, gets me is the damage. Imagine if they're wrong yep. that it isn't safe and the damage that it would be caused. The but this happens all the time health, in our society. Look the at The damage to the economy, the damage to entire uh, national uh, economies and yeah, industries. Yeah, but think, think about the but increase in pharmaceuticals. And all so that stuff that, too. Very good the point. The thing is the damage, the, the potential damage caused by this is so great that no company, not even Monsanto, would be able to uh, make it better by awarding some sort of financial compensation right, they, to the people that are hurt by it. Once they own every living organism on the planet, doesn't once matter. you patented things, yeah. it doesn't matter. You've got, you're, you're making revenue off of everything. You can't legally go out and patent a strawberry that's organic, that just grows in the ground. But if you alter that strawberry genetically, it is now yours. Mm -hmm. If you've created that seed, mm -hmm. that's yours. That's your patent. You can make the money off of that. And you bring up a very good point how they live with themselves. I will give you an example. Um, at the Monsanto cafeteria, they feed themselves organic food. It's another big eye-opener for me as well. Are you talking about at the building where at they the, actually the, work? Exactly, yep. Um, so why isn't this public? Why hasn't somebody gone in and videotaped this and put this on YouTube and said, look, even their well, own staff is not eating their food? Now. There are people coming forward. Dr. Mercola has come forward with quite a few different reviews as well um, between scientists and doctors feeding their families organic food while advocating genetically modified food. Um, as well, if you heard mm. about the organic spies, which were just done in California with the Whole Foods stores there, I think they went to 13. I heard, I saw those. Whole the Whole Foods, foods are, it's a first, right? Yeah, well, there was about 75% of the employees saying, no, we don't carry any genetically modified foods whatsoever. You won't find anything here that's genetically modified. But I've gone into Whole Foods myself. There's complete aisles of canola oil, which is 99% GMO. Um, you've got regular ascorbic acid. Vitamin C now comes from corn, from genetically modified corn. Wow. Your high fructose corn syrup. And you've got to remember, too, that these companies will play with words and they'll play with things so that the consumers get mixed up. And a great example is high fructose corn syrup. Um, we all know that that's bad. And when you're looking, and I hope um, for the people that are out there now, I hope you're reading labels. But when you do see high fructose corn syrup, obviously we make a connection in our head, okay, that's bad, I shouldn't be eating this. But now they want to change that to corn sugar. So as you're looking through these labels, you're reading, you see corn sugar, a light doesn't go off in your brain saying high fructose corn syrup. And another great one is MSG, for example. When they put monosodium glutamate, people don't know what that is. So they see monosodium glutamate, they don't make the connection of MSG, it just goes right into their body, right? Okay, uh, the election in the States last week, uh, they had a, didn't they have a proposition in California to label yeah, uh, GMOs? Prop 37. What happened? Do you want to comment on that? Definitely. Um, I thought it went through, uh, about 6 in the morning, I thought it went through. Uh, there was a couple recounts there at the end, 47% they said, uh, so it didn't go through. 
but 47 percent voted in favor, which does mean that over in favor of labeling. In favor of labeling. But 53 percent yes. said no. 53 percent said no. At first, I believe it was 81 percent saying yes before the all no on 37 came out. Now the FBI is looking into no on 37. They really are. Yep, they really are. They've actually uh, said that it um, it was an illegal campaign, uh, or there are some. Uh, skeptics that have brought this up that says it's an illegal campaign, so the FBI is looking into it now. Um, isn't there some controversy about votes not being counted or something? There's like some other too? controversy there too, yeah, and I've yeah. got to look into it more um, as of the mm. news today, but uh, just as of a few days ago, the FBI was just looking into it. Um, basically, what it does mean though, and in positive note, uh, over four and a half million Californians did vote uh, in favor of labeling, as well it created a whole lot of awareness in the communities, which I feel is the best way to beat the monster in this sense. You can't go to battle with these people in courts. You can't get up in the ring and fight them one-on-one. -on -one. It has to be a grassroots movement, and a great example would be the non-GMO project, with which the Big Carrot started, in, um, as well as California, with a few companies in California. So this is basically getting certain companies on board, signing a 10-year waiver saying, we will never use genetically modified organisms in our products, even down to the derivative. And so they're basically doing that themselves as opposed to having, uh, oh. having GMO well, labels. Well, companies, why don't they, la they could label themselves. That they, they could. Are, just like that, yep. that, that, that they're not going to use them. And because I think that as the awareness builds. I think it'll become mainstream quite soon where people, and just like MSG, where people are saying, is there MSG in this? Yeah. Or, you know, when you say, like, water is a mandatory label on ingredients. Why aren't GMOs? It's just an added extra line. And, mm -hmm. and just, just mm -hmm. to educate um, myself and uh, as well as the viewers, if it says, okay, so if it says no GMO, it doesn't mean organic but if it says organic does it mean no GMO uh, generally yes if it mean if it says organic generally these are going without the use of pesticides without the use of herbicides without the use of uh, fungicides um, and it's from an organic seed source so it's in its natural holistic exactly whole but state. You, the, the thing is, is I mean then the USDA you've looked at the, I mean people looked at them recently and said there's been slip-ups and, and, and falters there as well where things have got through but I think more than ever people have to be more on a community seasonable sustainable local level where you can meet a farmer and these like farmers aren't out to lie to you you go to a farmer and talk to them they're going to be very probably impressed by you as a consumer to begin with that you're um, asking that questions interested. Yeah. exactly and asking yeah. questions and they'll be happy enough to give you any answers you're looking for okay so people have to do something about them about this and one of the things they can do is go on your uh, website where yep. you've got the the campaign Definitely. Yeah. I have both my Facebook and my Twitter going under Zach Sheik, the same name. Uh, our, our campaign is under www.labelgmos.net, all one word. We have over 3,000 signatures already. We were just part of the Kids' Right to Know Walk, which happened on November 3rd with Rachel here in town. She's um, also part of the Big Carrot. She's grade 8. She's in grade 8. I think she's 13 years old. And she started her own campaign to create awareness within youth and within children. Because the kids are the ones that are eating the most of these, right? It's mostly processed foods, which, uh, where you've got the, the highest amount of genetically modified organisms or GMO foods, mm -hmm. especially from corn. Basically, uh, the consumers can also, you can stay away from corn, canola, soy, um, cotton is a big one. It's hard to get on the topic of cotton right now because we're all wearing cotton. Mm -hmm. So wait a second, mm -hmm. you can't... It affects you if you wear GMO products? It doesn't affect you if you wear GMO products, and this is where things slip up. Because we, no one eats cotton, everyone knows cottonseed oil is bad for them. Because no one eats cotton, that one flew under the radar. They're now oh. linking over 250,000 suicides in India to the GE cotton industry that is there. You've got so cottonseed oil, we're talking about the cottonseed oil you do? No, cottonseed oil would be the only thing you ingest. Like, no one would be eating cotton. But so which is why it slipped under the radar. Wearing well, these shirts leads to suicide? I'm not sure it leads to suicide. I'm just saying it's being linked now. Wow. Um, in the past 15 years, there's been over 250,000 suicides in India. And I will tell you that just as of yesterday, uh, an Indian Supreme High Court did, they are looking at a... Uh, 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 basically having Monsanto to be banned from the country for 10 years, mm. for the next 10 years, because they're linking this now. Basically, you've had, you have organic cotton, an organic cotton industry there, right? But when Monsanto buys up seed banks, they'll buy up these seed banks, they'll destroy the organic seed, they'll create their own seed. Now, this seed destroys, it. they're called terminator seeds. So these seeds huh. end their own lifespan every year. So the farmer has to go back and buy a new seed every single year so as well as them. they sign a contract. It's not only costing them that, these seeds that were supposed to do more and supposed to grow more and use less, actually use more pesticides, a Roundup, mm. and guess who owns the Roundup? Monsanto. It's a big cycle. It's a no big cycle that keeps getting so paid. See? So they own the Roundup. Um, you have to use more water for these. Now, if their crops fail, these farmers don't have insurance on their crops. So they all of a sudden owe hundreds of thousands wow. of rupees to Monsanto or to whatever, whatever subsidiary conglomerate wow. that's working for them. And wow. the number one way to commit suicide is to drink a liter of Roundup. <gasps> wow. yeah. In India? In India. Wow. 
So it's a very scary topic very and I don't sad. get to talk about it enough because no one eats cotton, mm -hmm. right? And that's what I meant by cottonseed oil. People know that it's bad, okay. but because we wear cotton, we forget about it in the sense that it's destroying another are culture. Are you wearing cotton right now? I, I, I'm wearing a little bit of cotton. There are certain things like H&M has started 50% organic cotton. Okay. Um, I, okay. My bed sheets are organic cotton. Okay. Um, I try okay. to as much as possible do okay. try to source those out, yep. but it's really hard. Like I'm an ambassador for Lululemon as well. And it's really hard because you've got these certain companies and they can't thrive over here yeah, by yeah. paying people properly. No, but, but at least you're trying and you can really say that you're being part of the solution, not the problem. And you can't go from zero to 10 without going one, two, three. So you're at least you're getting Definitely. there. And that's why I hope everyone can come together, uh, vegans as well as paleos, as well as hunter gatherers and vegetarians. We all don't like factory farming, right? All of us don't, in the majority, once they learn about GMOs, they don't like GMOs either, or they're a little timid yeah, of them, or yeah, a little scared of eating yeah. them, and I would be very questionable about it as well. Um, and, and basically, if we can create a stronger force and not such a divide between these different segregated eating cultures, then, uh, then I yeah. think we could really do this, okay. especially well, on a community level. Thank you level. for the education, I learned a lot. Zach, thank I wish you. we could uh, keep wow. you on a little sure. bit longer. And your passion. And, and you'll have to come back and keep us uh, up to date with what's going on in this industry. Definitely. Next stop. year we'll be working with some schools as well. So Excellent. And I know there's no level. sneezing, no sniffling, no allergies, no anything. So <laughs> labelgmos.net <laughs> is the website. And you can go there, sign the petition. And Zach, uh, please come back uh, and yeah. let us know what's new uh, whenever okay. there is something new on this. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. So thank you. Actually, we got a couple of vi a video, uh, another help. video about uh, about the GMOs, about uh, the genetic roulette that we're playing by having this stuff in uh, our society. So that's it for the it's show. The uh, awesome thing. show. Facing. Wow. Yes, yeah, Sandra, thank you for doing this. <laughs> thanks, Aaron, for running yeah, the show. Thank and you, uh, thanks, everybody, for coming on the show. That's it. We'll see you tomorrow for more Liquid Lunch right here on that one channel. Species and force it into the DNA of other species. We have hundreds of millions of acres of genetically modified crops that have been planted in the United States, and yet most people are not aware. I found out that our food supply is genetically modified. And guess what? The food that my son ate on August 25th, 2009 was raw corn. The corn that almost killed him. The process of insertion plus cloning creates massive collateral damage. There can be hundreds or thousands of mutations up and down the DNA. The things we're seeing today aren't normal. Illnesses that weren't epidemic before are now epidemic. We have gone from food in its whole food form to food undergoing a scientific experiment. The havoc that it will cause will be across the entire spectrum of disease. What the problem was is I guess he said that they weren't able to process the food correctly and they would bloat up and die from it. They can put it on the market without telling the FDA or to consumers. It became clear that the FDA had been lying repeatedly since 1992. It's not just an agriculture issue, it's not just a food industry issue, it's an ever-living creature issue. And if we don't do anything within a decade, every single major crop with any significant market size is gonna be genetically modified, and we're not gonna know it. The world can get rid of it. The world should get rid of it. The sooner, the better, now. We look at what they're eating, and we take out the genetically modified foods and the industry foods, and they all get better. It never doesn't work. I don't want to be a human lab rat, and I certainly don't want my two-year-old daughter to be a human lab rat. It's not about feeding the world. It's not about the blind will see and the lame shall walk. It's about chemical companies selling chemicals. What have I done to my children? And what has been done to them without my consent?